All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Welcome back to the show. I am sitting in my home office, smiling ear to ear and doing my own little happy dance because I just received the email that the Be Well by Kelly protein powder is on its way to Amazon. So by the time this episode comes out, my fingers are crossed that it's been accepted and it's available to you online. This protein powder has been something I've been working on for over a year and I have chosen a Swedish grass-fed beef protein isolate and I chose to go this direction because it's a chemical-free process that that includes not only all the essential amino acids your body needs, including those branch chain amino acids, but it also contains naturally occurring collagen amino acids. So it's the best of both worlds in a chemical free process. It's great for anyone with a food allergy. It's non-dairy. There's no egg, no soy, no gluten. And the formulation is very simple. It's that grass-fed beef isolate plus organic vanilla or organic cacao and organic monk fruit. So you have vanilla, chocolate, and unflavored depending on your preference. And it's over 20 grams of protein and an easy, simple way to build a whole food Fab Four smoothie. So I'm thrilled. I'm so excited for you guys to try it. If you try it and love it, review us on Amazon. Let me know how you are liking your Fab Four smoothie with the Be Well by Kelly protein. And just know that I really appreciate you guys. I'm just been so excited to provide products and courses and really just get to know my audience a little bit better and continue to bring awesome people on the show. So let's get to the point. It is time for the Be Well by Kelly podcast. And today's guests are two of my friends, two people I look up to very much and have been following for a very long time, Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf. Diana Rogers is a registered dietitian with a clinical practice helping people recover their health through real food. Her blog, Sustainable Dish, started as a healthy, locally sourced recipe site, but has grown into a much deeper dive into food systems. She has spent the last 18 years living and working on an organic farm that grows vegetables and raises pasture-raised meat. She met Rob in 2011 after reading his book, The Paleo Solution, which I've also read and you should read, which has sold nearly a million copies. And for me personally, I've followed Rob's work since 2010. And also, like I said, read the book. Rob Wolf trained as a research biochemist. Rob discovered that the optimal human diet is one that most closely mimics our ancestral ways of eating before the invention of ultra processed foods. Both of them have dealt with severe digestive issues, have minds that question everything, and are always looking to find the truth behind commonly held beliefs. In addition to their firsthand experience with food production and deep backgrounds in 
science. They have read many books, interviewed experts, and have attended a remarkable number of conferences on agriculture. They quickly bonded over their interest, not only in optimal human health, but in discovering which food production methods were best from a sustainable perspective. And thank goodness they did, because I truly believe our bodies and the world will be healthier because of them. Their new book and film, Sacred Cow, is going to debunk using real science, the lies you've been told about red meat. Sacred Cow is available right now for pre-order, so pause the show and buy it immediately. I am so thankful for their work, and I can't wait for you to hear from them firsthand. So let's get going. Welcome to the show, you guys. I'm so excited to have you. I feel like I have literally been waiting for this for... It feels like a year, but you've probably been working on it way longer than that. So thank you so much for being here. Huge thank honor. You. Thank you. Yeah. I think that Sacred Cow does a really amazing job of breaking down like three segments of what people worry about when they're eating meat. Um, part one, you make a case for the nutritional side of eating red meat. Part two, the environmental case. And then part three is the ethical case. So I'd love to just kind of really get into the nitty gritty and and break it down. So let's jump in. I have a number of clients and followers who don't eat red meat because they have watched a documentary or they think it's bad for them or worse, it will cause cancer. Can we talk about the health of red meat? Definitely. Um, Rob, you want to take that one? I'll I'll try jumping into that. You know, the... It's interesting. The studies that are done in nutritional science... um, we do the best job that we can, and I, I don't want to vilify people who work very hard. And, and you know, it, it's uh, I don't want to say this. If you look at, at physicists doing work at the the uh, CERN super collider, where they're they're trying to discover like the fundamental building blocks of the universe, that's really technical, demanding work. But it's also an incredibly simple system. And once you get into biology and physiology and medicine and the interface of our genetics, our gut microbiome, the totality of our environment, which includes sunlight and physical contact and all the rest of this stuff, it's incredibly complex. So I I don't want to vilify people in the nutritional sciences for doing bad work. It's just hard work and it's expensive work and it's difficult. And what they've historically relied on are these food frequency questionnaires where they will ask people to recall what did you eat last week, last month, last year even. Like some of these really big studies where it says red meat causes cancer, part of the data that they're coming that they're pulling together is asking people 12 years ago how much red meat do you feel like you were eating? And nobody remembers this stuff. I mean, it, 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 that's a piece of it. Another piece of this is that the, the uh, people have a tendency to kind of cater to what they think the test questions are asking. So, you know, people assume that red meat is bad and alcohol is bad and stuff. So they underreport all of that stuff. And there's a, a pretty famous doctor, John Ioannidis, who has criticized these these the retrospective uh, uh, epidemiological studies, basically making the case that there is more noise there than signal. Like it, we really can't hang our hats on much of anything. Epidemiology was very powerful in helping us understand the connection between, say, tobacco and cancer, but the correlation there was like 10,000% for lung cancer, for emphysema, for things like that. When we're talking about the correlation for meat consumption and cancer or heart disease, it's like 2%. And and you need to get up to a number that's like 200% to start assuming that a correlational study, an epidemiological study like this, really has some some causative kind of kind of underpinnings. And in addition to that, the numbers get really played with a lot. So here's here's an, an example of that. In a westernized culture, westernized population, there is a background incidence of about 5% for colon cancer. Everybody has this risk. That's just kind of the the background noise that's going on. The studies that have been done which again are asking people to recall how much did you eat? What types of things did you eat? It may have been anywhere from days, weeks, months, or years in the past. 
they collect this data, massage it, and then based off of this, they they suggest that the the consumption of daily intake of red meat or or processed meat increases your all your absolute risk for colon cancer to 6%. So it's 5% just being alive and having a pulse. It's 6% assuming that there's any truth to the data that's being collected. But then the way that this gets reported is that red meat consumption increases your risk of colon cancer by 20% because the difference between 5% and 6% is 20%. So there's a lot of really concerning features there, you know, and it, 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 it's possible that there may be something associated with that. But then when we look at cultures like the Inuit and the Maasai and the, uh, the uh, 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 Simene in, in Bolivia, they consume significant amounts of animal products and they have significantly lower rates of all of these chronic degenerative diseases, including cancer. And so we do have some kind of natural experiments where we see cultures that consume significant amounts of animal products, but without, you know, the westernized influence of refined foods and sleep disturbance and fractured family units and whatnot. And we just don't see the same type of incidence of of disease that would be suggested by these retrospective uh, discussions. Yeah, these studies can be so convoluted in those numbers, especially when they're headlines of an increase of 20% can be so scary for people. And I feel like it when you watch the documentaries, they can really make you sad and make you feel like, wow, if I eat red meat, I'm hurting myself. I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to have to detoxify this. And it's not, they're not thinking about it as nutrition. Can we, can we flip the tables, like turn the tables and talk about the nutrition of red meat, because I think it's been vilified so much, especially with the increase in cancer rates and, and from these just community-based studies. Yeah, what? Diana has, has done yeah. some amazing work on this, just looking at the, the nutrient density of uh, different food sources. Yeah, and also um, just the the value of protein in our diets and the satiating quality of protein. And uh, the RDA for protein has been... uh, First, it was designed um, after looking at these nitrogen balance studies, which are highly flawed um, and did not take into account any of the other balance, uh, you know, value of uh, meat and protein in the diet. Uh, and then, um, you know, so 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, that's the absolute minimum you need to like not die. Um, that is not the optimal amount. Um, but because Americans don't know what kilograms are and we don't like to do math very much, they've gone ahead and done those calculations for us. Um, but they were basing the average woman on the ideal body weight of 125 pounds and for a man, 154 pounds. And so when we see these numbers, you own, women only need 45 grams of protein per day and men only need 54 grams of protein per day. Um, that's absolutely not true. Um, that is the minimum for very skinny men and women. Yeah, I was um, like, my husband's like 60 pounds more than that. Uh-huh. <laughs> In 6'4". Like that's never going to work. <laughs> right. Um, and so when we look at um, the, uh, the other ways of looking at protein and you know a, a, a bare minimum at 10%, which is closer to where Americans are uh, in their overall calories um, and the upper limit at 35%. If we, if we look at um, a conservative 20, 20% of daily calories from protein um, on a 2000 calorie a day diet, that would mean 100 grams of protein per day. So that's a way more protein than anyone walking into my nutrition practice is, is currently Typically eating. eating yeah. Um, and what I see as a clinician and what we know from, from studies is that when folks increase their just protein period, they're less hungry and they're less likely to binge on nutrient poor foods. Um, and then when we look at what are the best sources of protein, red meat and seafood top the charts. Um, way better than boneless, skinless chicken breast or, um, you know, any of the plant-based proteins. So it's, it's less calories and more nutrition 
and especially nutrition that you can't get from plants like B12 um, and things that are very difficult to get from plants like iron. So we've got major problems with B12 and iron deficiency um, worldwide. And um, those can easily be absorbed from red meat, something that um, our consumption of has actually just flatlined since 1970. So everyone just assumes we all must eat less meat. We're eating way too much meat. But the average American, you know, what actually makes it onto our dinner plates is about two ounces per person per day of red meat. So it's, it's not these 72 ounce steaks that everyone's envisioning when they say we eat too much meat. That's yeah, pretty amazing because I can echo your uh, experience in your nutrition practice. It's it's interesting. One of the number one recommendations I make for people is to increase their protein intake, and they're always really scared. Like, well, most people are saying like better quality meat, but less. But it is like the number one way I get people to stop snacking, stop having cravings, to really feel calm in their body. And I think it has so much to do with what protein is a building block for hormones, neurotransmitters, like it, it's amazing. Absolutely. Kelly, yeah, and- it, get, it gets out in the weeds a little bit, but there's this concept in evolutionary biology called the uh, protein leverage hypothesis. And it puts this idea forward that all organisms tend to eat to a protein minimum. And this is, it's so interesting because it's true whether we're talking about grazing animals or carnivores or ob- omnivores, but the, the idea here is that the brain specifically is looking for nutrition mainly in the form of protein because protein-dense foods tend to come with the most nutrition. So again, even uh, cattle or sheep will preferentially graze on clover versus grass because the clover is more nutrient-dense and that can actually be problematic if, if taken to an excess. But if we hit that protein minimum, then we tend to be satiated where we, we feel full and we feel full over the long haul. If we under eat protein, and what's really interesting is we see this even in the low carb ketogenic community, people there are afraid of protein, mTOR and cancer and all this type of stuff. And folks are really under eating protein and then they tend to overeat fat. So the, the fix that we see for people getting good body composition and spontaneously reducing calorie intake involves getting your protein on point. And then some people do better on higher carbs. Some people do better on lower carb. But if you don't eat adequate protein, you will overeat everything else. And it's just kind of a, a guaranteed deal. Yeah. It's yeah it's, oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, please. Oh, I was just going to mention um, for women in particular, it's, um, I'm sure you've seen that, uh, you know, telling a woman to eat more red meat or just more protein in general is especially taboo in our culture because women are supposed to be eating boneless, skinless chicken breast um, or just light salads, right? Um, And so getting a woman to eat a steak is actually quite a mental exercise that I have to, I have to walk with them through. Yeah, I've, I've actually had that same experience, but it, I'm sure you've seen this in your practice too. You just, you just see the calm come over them. You see them eating less and, and feeling better. It's just a scary hump to get over for so many of us. What, um, what have you guys seen in regards to like body composition changes for people who increase their protein intake? What about like um, blood test changes. Have you seen any anything diagnostically there in your practice with the clients that you guys work with? Yeah. And it, you know, I'll, I'll maybe tackle one of the mm-hmm. extreme ends of, of this story when we overeat any given macronutrient. So even though I'm, I'm a fan of low-carb diets, I tend to eat a more fat-fueled diet. There's a reality that fat is the easiest macronutrient to store if you overeat it. So this is one of the hazards of a low-carb diet. You tend to eat more fat. Fattier foods tend to be more calorically dense. It's easy to overdo. Second to that is carbohydrate. Carbohydrate has to get converted from carbs into fat. And there's a little bit of an energy cost there. It's not super efficient. But we we can overeat a, a carbohydrate also. And the fat-carb combo is particularly deadly. Because you know, you think about pizza and ice cream. Now we start getting into the neuroregulation of appetite and stuff like that. And these really interesting flavor combinations really drive the ability to overeat. But when they've done protein overfeeding studies in folks, it's very difficult 
to store body fat from overeating protein specifically. Typically, what happens is people gain muscle mass, they gain bone mass, and, and if they gain any weight, it's, it's relatively little because protein has what's called a high thermic effect. It tends to elevate the kind of physiological activity of our body. So there's just less energy left available to be stored as body fat. So that's kind of taking the outer extreme. Like we're not advocating anybody overeat, but it's also interesting. How do we get people in a modern hyperpalatable food environment to eat at a normal level that's healthy for them? And protein ends up being really critical on that. What recommendations are you making for people when it comes to, I mean, you said 20% of their daily caloric intake, but are you, are you on the higher end of that? Do you ever go higher than that? Like, What recommendations are you making generally for people who want to increase their protein intake? Do you think there's like a ceiling or a percentage that we should be aiming for? Um, in the book, we we have a little 30 day challenge that looks at sustainability and you know optimizing your diet. And um, you know, Rob and I both probably tend to eat way more protein than even 20 percent of diet. Um, but what we try to do is just give them general guidelines on where to start because folks are just in general eating way too many carbs and uh, not enough protein. So we have general recommendations, um, but we're also um, huge fans of, you know, Whole30, of keto, of whatever works for you, right? Um, And so what we see with a lot of these diets, and even when people initially go vegan, is that they're excluding ultra-processed foods. And that's the real ticket to all of this. Um, And so then if you were to take like a well-planned vegan diet that, you know, contains a lot of like organic, locally sourced vegetables, but then you add meat to it, that's what we're recommending pretty much. Um, and so that's where we go with the starting point. But then we do have notes for, um, for folks if you, um, you know, are more, notice that you're more carb sensitive or less carb sensitive or um, have different goals. You, know, you might want to tweak it this way or, or that way. And, and Kelly, like a, a, a kind of a rule of thumb, I guess, that we use is somewhere between a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass all the way up to a gram of protein per pound of body weight and or a gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. And so there's a couple of different ways that we can kind of zero in on that. And this is is a little bit dependent on maybe the psychology of, of the person we're, mm-hmm. we are working with so that we can best meet them. If they're really geeky, then we can get in and do a little bit of math and they'll, they'll geek out on that. And they're really excited about food scales and measuring. And then other people, their eyes cross and they're just like, dude, tell me what to eat for breakfast, lunch, dinner. And so we, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, medium sized female, then we're like, Hey, we want you to get at least 40 grams of protein at breakfast, lunch, dinner. These are seven different protein sources that provide 40 grams of protein in this amount. And then from there, you know, focus mainly on multicolored vegetables, uh, play around if you feel better or worse with like sweet potatoes or rice or different things like that. And then we can kind of customize based off individual needs. Again, as, as Diana alluded, are they more carb sensitive? Are they less carb sensitive? And even that can change over time, both for the better and the worse. Uh, folks who have a new baby, they become insulin resistant because they don't sleep well. And so somebody that may be motored along great on a higher carb, but adequate protein diet, right in that, that postnatal period, they might benefit from restricting carbohydrate a little bit because that insulin resistance from sleep deprivation becomes a real deal. And as the kid gets a little older and they start sleeping better, then they can reintroduce the carbohydrates because they're sleeping better. So it's it, the, one of the big dangers that we see across the board is making recommendations that are simple enough for people to get and be able to action on them. But then what people love to do is pull out a stone tablet and carve them into like religious law. And they're like, well, no, Rob and Diana said one gram of, pro, you, you know, and, and, and it's like, no, 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 these are starting points. And then we have to tinker and adjust from there. Absolutely. Just knowing yourself and what you need and knowing that your body is changing based on where you are in your life is so, so important. Yeah. I have a quick question on um, that just because you touched on breastfeeding. One of the biggest fears I have with clients who um, are pregnant or breastfeeding 
is lowering their carbohydrate intake either because they've been told to have 200 grams of carbohydrates a day when they're pregnant and or they're worried if they lower their carbohydrate intake that milk supply will drop. How do you feel about that? Do you want to tackle that, Diana, or do you want me to... Yeah, I mean, I I don't think that breastfeeding is necessarily the time in your life when you want to be calorie restricting, you know, overall, right? That's probably the worst time um, to be doing that. Um, I've had two kids and I... um, I was thrilled that I could just basically eat whatever I wanted I just, whatever I could think of, I just ate it and I was still losing weight and, you know, able to breastfeed my kids. And I mean, it was like one of the happiest times of my life, (laughs) but I get it. You know, uh, you do get more, you know, the sleep deprivation is no joke. And, um, and folks do struggle with weight loss and, um, insulin resistance and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, so getting enough Real food nutrition. Um, our friend Lily Nichols has a really yeah, good book on amazing. that. Real, real food for pregnancy. Do you know that? I book? love her stuff. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. um, I usually defer to her when it comes to anything related to babies and pregnancy because that is her total wheelhouse. Um, and and yeah. you know, she makes a, a great point that when a woman becomes pregnant, there's a certain amount of physiological insulin resistance that occurs that helps to goose nutrients to the fetus. So you don't want the mom to soak up all the fat, all the carbs, all the protein. So the mom becomes a little bit insulin resistant just as a natural consequence of of pregnancy. If we overlay that with a stressed lifestyle, inadequate sleep, an inappropriate diet, you know, seed oils, refined carbohydrates, we could make the case that women are likely entering into that scene already in an insulin resistant state. So you overlay the two of them and we end up with situations like gestational diabetes. And I I understand the the concern on on the folk of on the part of practitioners, you know, working with these, these people, but it's really important to understand that the, the problems that are in instilled into the, child and the baby in that gestationally, uh, uh, you know, diabetic environment are really significant, you know, excessive birth weight, a tendency towards obesity throughout the rest of their life. This is where epigenetics start playing a really important factor in this story. And, you know, Lily isn't recommending a ketogenic diet specifically for moms in this situation, but, you know, 200, I don't eat 200 grams of carbohydrate a day and I'm 175 pound, you know, 8% body fat, do jujitsu five days a week, lift weights. And that would be too much for me. And that's not to say that there aren't people that run well on that, but it shouldn't be crazy to suggest that, hey, let's feed you at a level that we're not inducing gestational diabetes. Like, is that a crazy suggestion? Maybe it's 50 grams a day for you. Maybe it's 100 grams a day. Maybe it depends on the degree of activity you've had that day. And so on a more active day, then you have a little bit more on a less active day or a poorer sleep day, you have a little bit less. So it it shouldn't be that crazy. And again, to Diana's point, I I guess the, the danger in adequate protein intake is that it is satiating. And so people can under under eat potentially so it is something that we need to keep an eye on both with with pregnancy and breastfeeding that that isn't so profound that folks are overtly under eating and then we create unintended you know consequences with that yeah i um i agree with you too i was when i got pregnant with sebastian my 19 month old i was pretty metabolically flexible and i was testing ketone levels just because i was like trying to get to my lean, sort of like to be lean in my fighting weight mm-hmm. before I got pregnant. And I knew the minute I was pregnant from a ketone, from like a ketometer before I knew from a pregnancy test, because my ketones were like off the charts, like oh, above two and not, and I was never getting that high of numbers. So it was interesting. I kept my carbs like moderately low, like I would say on average, like 50 to 75, not mm-hmm. like not like 25, but I felt phenomenal my whole pregnancy. And, um, and really like, I, I think I gained an, a, like a good amount of weight. It wasn't, I never felt really swollen or puffy. And, but I will tell you my entire pregnancy, I craved red meat. All I wanted mm. 
grass fed burgers and like um and a lot of red meat and i and i never felt guilty about it because i think i understand regenerative farming and like how how grazing animals can be supportive of our land and our world and our ecosystem but i would love because you guys are the expert experts in this to if other mamas out there or other people out there crave red meat to not feel bad about it because they think they're ruining the environment Totally. There's a lot of guilt going on. It, like we were talking earlier, especially with women, um, they you know don't want to kill beautiful animals. They you know want to save the environment and they want the best health. And if you listen to any mainstream health source, um, all points go straight to don't eat red meat, right? Right. Um, and so it's there's a lot of deprogramming. I mean, I had to hear. Sally Fallon, but right when I when I first got into this whole thing, my first pregnancy, I had to hear her say eat butter like seven times before I would actually eat butter um, <laughs> because I was so freaked out by this. So um, I get it. And um, it's really hard to unlearn something that you grew up um, learning your whole life, right? right. About food. Um, but what we see with, um, with the health, um, we also see in the environment and a lot of the blame that's going to cattle is super unfair. So, um, you know, there's, there's a few different uh, main kind of critiques, right? So one is that uh, farting cattle are worse than transportation, right? So the, the greenhouse gases and methane. We have also that they're uh, water hogs and they just kind of suck up water and it's super inefficient and, you know, a total waste. Uh, that why would you graze cattle on land instead of just planting tomatoes or carrots or potatoes because you would get so many more pounds of food that way? Um, so the land use argument, um, water, land use, and then there's a feed Stealing use argument. Stealing food. Yeah, 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 yeah. That um, they're eating grain that we could eat directly, and it would just be a lot more efficient if if humans ate the grain directly. And uh, you know, it's twelve, sometimes twenty pounds of grain is what you hear per pound of steak. So pick pick a whack a mole, and we'll try to <laughs> pick pick one, and we can we can go we can start there. down it. Yeah, let's start with climate uh, change and methane because I think that's that's hmm. one of the biggest ones that people talk about. Sounds good. Okay. Well, um, when cattle digest their food, they uh, the rumen in their stomach, the bacteria in their stomach, break down um, the cellulose into um, emit methane, basically through their digestive process. The cows actually belch it out. They're not farting it out. They're they're burping it. Um, when the methane goes into the atmosphere, after about ten years, it breaks into H two O water that becomes part of the water cycle, like rain. Mm -hmm. And CO2, which is actually taken up by plants, they um, give off O2, which is what we breathe. And then the carbon molecule goes down into the grass and into the roots. It's leaked down to the microorganisms. There's this whole magic uh, symbiotic relationship between the microorganisms and uh, and the grass. And um, carbon can actually get sequestered as the grass goes back. And That's so, the thing we call soil. <laughs> 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 um, and so, when you look at when you look at a natural animal going through this cycle, and um, and before we got rid of all the bison and elk and pronghorn, there were way more ruminants uh, in North America than there are today with just cattle. So it's not like we're we have more methane breathing evil, you know, animals than we did before. Um, anyway, so uh, when you compare that to fossil fuels and uh, taking up locked carbon that's been in the atmosphere for millions of years, um, extracting it out and then pumping it directly into the atmosphere as CO2 and methane, that is a much more toxic process because it's not part of a cycle. There's no there's no equilibrium no sequestering. to that. Exactly. Um, but then there's also the numbers aspect and how those numbers are calculated. Um, the, the numbers that actually are, are blaming cattle as being worse than transportation 
we're actually looking at a full life cycle assessment of cattle. So everything that went into the feed, all, all the emissions associated with transportation, with processing, getting it to your door, all those greenhouse gases were calculated into the cow versus for transportation when they did those uh, the the calculations against it, there is no life cycle assessment worldwide for transportation. And so they just looked at tailpipe emissions from cars and airplanes. They didn't look into all the different pieces that go into actually building those planes, transporting those cars across oceans and things like that. And Kelly, uh, so maybe, a point- maybe a oh, quick a, a kind of interesting example there. You know, I'm really excited about the potential of solar energy and, you know, electric cars and stuff like that. But when you look at the life cycle analysis of a battery that is used in that, we have to mine all these rare earths. There's all the energy in, involved with that. And currently we ship that to China. It gets processed. It ships back here and we do some fiddling with it. It may go back and forth across the Pacific like six or eight times. And then it gets built into a car. And then that thing only has about an eight to 10 year lifetime before it needs to be recycled. And it can't be 100% recycled. So this is some of the stuff that when you do the full accounting on a topic, again, you know, you know like solar energy is great. That's really cool stuff. But it's, there's no free lunch out there other than, ironically, sunlight, grass, herbivores, ecology. That is the closest thing to a free lunch that we have. But we're so enamored with technology that we assume that there are these better ways of, of doing these things. But the, the, the methodology that painted animal husbandry as being disproportionately bad from a greenhouse gas perspective, it was really remarkably, I, I can't even say poorly done. Like it, it, it was... Uh, irresponsible. It, it was yeah. incredibly irresponsible because you're not comparing apples to apples. And you know, if w- we need to be really honest about this stuff, because if we have bad data and we're creating policy from like the World Health Organization level, from the United Nations level on down, and it's based off of flawed information, we are going to make absolutely the wrong decisions about how to tackle climate change. And it just affects everyone on every level. So you're, you're affecting your soil health, you're, you're affecting the animal's health, you're affecting the human's health. And then they're, enact, they're putting in these policies where universities are going to go completely vegetarian or plant-based mm-hmm. and then not looking at the, the consequences on that human's health. It's, it's really hard. Exactly. And um, yeah, so I, I don't think we have time to like get into all of the <laughs> nutritional arguments, but what we did do is outline them and back them up with, with peer-reviewed science in the book. Um, but we also have a film coming out as well. And we, um, you know, because a lot of people don't have the time or um, might not know ranchers that are doing regenerative agriculture, we wanted to bring that to them. And so we visit with ranchers who are restoring millions of acres um, just with cattle. Uh, and then we talk to, you know, ex-vegans, we, uh, we explore ethics, we look at uh, nutrition science, all of that there. And then Rob and I are also making a course called Meat Curious. And it's for <laughs> folks. <laughs> That's cute. That, yeah, it's um, for anyone that maybe either cut down on their meat or is worried about their meat consumption, or maybe we're a, a, a vegetarian or vegan, um, anyone who's sort of on the fence and worried, we're actually walking them through all of this in a course, uh, in a course format. Uh, so we're really just trying to, you know, help folks and then provide them with uh, resources on how to ethically source better meat. So when will the film be available and when will the course be available? The course will come out with the book um, July 14th, which is the launch date for the book. Uh, the film I am uh, wrapping up right now. So we just did the narration. Uh, Nick Offerman is actually the narrator for the film, which is really fun. Um, and we're just in those last stages of like color and sound and all of that. So I think the film, I'm hoping that it's going to be ready for everyone, at least to get a sneak preview Uh maybe later in July, early August, just at least for a sneak peek before it then makes it on to like a major streaming platform. Oh, that's so exciting. I literally cannot wait. Oh, Thank you. It's going to be amazing. 
Um, well, we'll make sure that this podcast goes up the week that it is released so that people can all get their hands at least on the book and anxiously wait for the, for the course and, and the film. Um, so let's pop into the couple other topics that you were talking about in re- regard to environmental case, um, mm-hmm. about cattle taking up too much land, too much water, and too much resources. Kelly, the, the water usage story is really interesting. And this is one of the things that is, is thrown around, really painting a picture that uh, plant products are more efficient from a water usage perspective than animal products are. And there was actually a fantastic paper. That, Dana, it came out of the Netherlands, right? Where they did the, the kind of analysis on a green water versus blue water versus gray water. I, you know, I didn't look at where it came out of, but I know the author's name is like Hokestra or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it was a really well done paper. And interestingly, the, the authors of the papers say, make the case that animal products are more water intensive than say like plant-based products. But what's interesting in that is they, they have these three different designations of water. Green water, which is water that just falls from the sky in the form of rain onto the ground. We have blue water, which includes lakes, streams, and underground aquifers. And then we have gray water, which is kind of the waste water element of, you know, whether we're talking about a, a car wash or a farm, you know, it's the kind of effluent that comes out the, the back end of the process. And what these folks did is they, they counted all of the water that goes into feeding grasslands, watering grasslands, as water usage. But it's literally, it cannot be used for any other purpose other than, than watering grassland. It, it, again, it's kind of, it, it's like if you're driving your car and you shift the, the thermostat over to the heater setting, or at least in older cars, you could do this. And you didn't have to turn the fan on, but you would just, because of, you were driving and there's air pressure, you would pull some heat off the engine. It's kind of like that. Like you're, it, It's the closest thing to getting something for free that you could imagine here. It's not reallocating this water away from anything else. And as Diana, Diana will probably make the, the point when we actually talk about the land usage element itself, mm-hmm. there's huge tracts of land that are amenable for nothing but grassland. Like that is what it is. It's not supposed to be farmland. It's not supposed to be forest. It's supposed to be the, you know, two thirds of the, the world's land masses are, are grasslands. And so when you account for that, and again, looking at this paper, we are drawing a different conclusion than what the the study authors concluded. But when you account for the fact that you're getting food from environments that can grow no other crops, that that the rain was going to fall on that land one one way or the other, then the, the animal products end up being actually incredibly efficient because it's not reallocating that water resource from somewhere else. And there, it, it, you know, we're not fans of the the industrial meat production system, but this is some of the stuff that will get us in trouble from a really diehard regenerative ag people and everything. But a, a, a industrial meat production is not as water intensive as most people play it out to be. Pasture finished is better, without a doubt. It's more ethical. It's got all these other upsides to it. But this is some of the stuff that. Again, trying to be honest because we didn't want to cite anything that could easily, you know, if, if some anti-meat individual wanted to go line by line through our book and they're like, ah, here's a gotcha. So we have some stuff in there that's kind of inconvenient from our narrative. We would love for the nutrient density of, of grass-fed meat versus conventional meat for there to be a bigger difference, but there's not. Meat is just nutritious. And, and man, I, we've had people mad at us over that. I mean, like really, really mad, but this is a really easily debunked thing. It would be beautiful if we could just say it's better for the environment, it's more ethical, and oh, by the way, it's three times more nutritious, but that is simply not the the case and it's indefensible from a scientific perspective. But again, you know, unpacking all of this story, the water usage piece really dovetails pretty quickly into the land use piece, which Diana, you do a better treatment of that than I, I do. Yeah. I mean, the, um, you know, when you compare even typical beef to rice, almonds, or avocados or sugar, um, 
typical beef is way better from a blue water perspective. That's the, that's the water that we need like from aquifers um, than rice, almond, avocados, and sugar. So um, we need to be looking at water in a different way. We need to be looking at, you know, is it water that actually is wasted or is it just naturally occurring water that's, a, that's you know, part of a water cycle? And cattle that are managed well actually increase the water, the water holding capacity of the soil, which is another thing that, you know, nobody's really mentioning here. Cropping is horrible for water cycles because exposed just plain dirt, when it rains a lot, that that creates runoff that not only takes dirt into streams, which um, messes with the oxygen and, and, you know, makes it cloudy and, and harder for things to grow in rivers, uh, but it also takes with it pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Um, when we have really healthy grasslands with nice deep roots, um, lots of carbon in there, which actually attracts water, uh, then a little bit of rain actually really makes a huge difference. And um, and uh, in the film, we go to Chihuahua, Mexico, and it is a dramatic difference between the ranch we're on, which looks like the Serengeti with these massive grasslands. I mean, it's it's breathtaking. But the whole entire drive to his ranch, same amount of rainfall, about eight, eight to 10 inches per year, um, barren desert, like with just some scrubby trees, hard pan soil that is just impermeable, practically cement. Wow. Um, and he's doing this all with just cattle. That's how he's been able to get the grasses back. So it's wow. pretty amazing. And this is where we can get then into the land use piece of this because in areas like that, it makes no sense to plow it up and plant soy or rice or wheat. Um, you know that it would m- require m- massive, you know, uh, amendments to the soil, chemicals, all these kinds of things. And so, when you look at the overall um, agricultural land that's on Earth, m- way more than half, about sixty, sixty-five, depending on what numbers you're looking at, is only suitable for grazing. For rangeland, it's either too rocky, too hilly, too brittle, or you know the soil's too poor, uh, and that's something that a lot of Americans just take for granted. They think that everywhere is sort of like when you're in a plane and you're looking down and you see those green squares and circles. We just sort of assume that the whole world is like that, um, but of course, anyone who's traveled or or watched National Geographic or something like that knows that there's many different ecosystems across the globe. And a lot of them are way more conducive to grazing animals than they are to crop production. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also a, a social justice aspect to this too. There are many places in the world where women are not allowed to own title to land, but they can own livestock. And livestock are um, not only essential for the nutrients that they need for themselves and for their children, which you know when women are taken care of, the kids are too. Um, but that's a currency for them that they can trade and 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 own. Um, and so it's it's really dangerous, I think, to have these global recommendations that we all must, um, you know, give up meat and start eating a plant based diet in in areas where there are no CVSs or Walgreens to go get a B twelve supplement, um, no doctor's offices to check your your nutrient status. I mean, uh, the amount of privilege that we have to be even discussing this and um, be able to push away such a nutrient dense food that humans have thrived on for three and a half million years is um, just something that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. And to think about like just the ethical ripples that happen when we're making these these big policy decisions or trying to influence a large majority of people. And it's, I mean, you just said it, like think about those moms who are owning cattle and how that might be their livelihood. That might be their job. It might be nourishing their family. And if demand goes down, you know, what's happening to them, right? Mm-hmm. So let's... let. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Just really quickly, I don't want to get out in the weeds too much with this, but on that, you know, like globalization and and equality are really big topics right now, and rightfully so. But it's interesting that uh, there have been some some fascinating outlets that have made the case that advocating a vegan diet is actually advocating for folks like Monsanto and Pfizer and some of these, you know, mega powerful. Uh, uh, 
a really world altering corporations, these multinational corporations. And it's, it's interesting from that perspective of, it, you know, if we want to be respectful of all peoples and all cultures, then recommending that we all shift to a, a row crop centric food system, which then basically makes most of the world dependent on our output and a few other, you, you know, locations around the world that can, can produce these foodstuffs. That, that's remarkable. We, we then have a, a world that is, dependent on something that is really uh, precarious, like one bad hurricane season, one, you know, one uh, uh, a blight that affects corn or wheat could, uh, you know, expose people to massive food insecurity. Whereas if we have a really decentralized food system, like, uh, Diana, where is it in Central America where guinea pigs, uh, Paraguay? Uh, Peru. 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 Peru, it, it, they don't have historically great refrigeration, um, the, but they have these big guinea pigs. And the guinea pigs are fantastic at converting inedible foodstuffs for humans into human quality food. And they just happen to be the size that a family can sit down and eat it and there's no leftovers and, and you're done. And it, you know, it's maybe weird for us. It's maybe different. But this is something that has served that culture for thousands of years. And now we're telling them that they're destroying the planet by following their, their conventional food ways. That, mm -hmm. That's a remarkable place of, of uh, hubris, in, in my opinion, to, to come from. Absolutely. And it, I mean, it kind of dovetails into your whole topic and ethics of meat being taboo. And, and mm -hmm. like, can we, can we touch on, on that a little bit more? Just like, people having these opinions that it's immoral to eat animals and that it should be taboo. Like, could we really survive on plants? I mean, if we wanted to. Yeah. I mean, me, I mean, the other uh, title that we had other than, other than sacred cow is scapegoat. And we almost called the book scapegoat and it literally beef is being unfairly scapegoated for our fears about health our fears about the environment and the guilt we feel um, because of our disconnection from food production, nature, our fear of death. Um, death isn't something that we um, want to talk about. Um, most Americans don't have a will. Uh, and we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to think about it. And we certainly, you know, don't want it on our plates. Uh, and so that's where a lot of that is coming from is, is that I just don't want to, you know, I want nothing to die for me. And what they're not realizing is that our current industrial agriculture system is destroying entire ecosystems, uh, not just one, you know, one large cow that can feed a family for a year, right? Um, and so when we look at all the death that happens from, um, you know, first you have to clear land for a field. So you either have to plow up a grassland or cut down a forest or something like that. Um, what happens to all the wildlife that was there? Then we, you know, drive tractors and plow it and we kill the soil and all the life that's inside the soil. Uh, and, and then we're spraying chemical pesticides and herbicides and killing pollinators. We're having a problem with uh, the bee populations right now. And the birds that rely on these insects are now becoming more extinct. Um, but the great thing is uh, organizations like Audubon Society are actually recognizing the benefits of good grazing. And there's a line of Audubon certified beef out there. Um, and so what we see with regenerative agriculture with that requires animals as part of the ecosystem because it's trying to mimic natural ways um, is way more biodiversity and way, way, way more life than could ever happen on, in a wheat field or a corn field. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's this thing called the principle of least harm. Um, and again, least harm, wanting to do least harm is noble. Um, but, but when you, again, consider all the death that might happen for a block of tofu versus the benefits that you would get from a regenerative, uh, you know, farm like where I live with ruminants mixing in their fertility into the crop beds and everything, um, 
we want we want that system. We want the system that is actually building soil health and sequestering carbon, not the uh, extractive um, regenerative or sorry, the extractive industrial agriculture system. It's amazing when we try to take over and fix something that's already this like beautiful cycle of sequestering carbon and increasing soil health and increasing the nutrition of the plants growing on that land and increasing then increasing the nutrition of the plant animals who are grazing on those grasses. It's just this like this amazing nutrient dense ecosystem that's protecting our world, but we just think we can do better by separating and making it fast and quick and tilling soil and planting rows of, of crops. Can you talk a little bit about your farm? I love following you and seeing um, oh. and seeing it online. <laughs> but I don't think people realize, unless they're following you, they may not realize when they read this book um, until you get into it, like w- what your background is. Yeah. Um, so I, I am a registered dietitian, but I've also been living on organic farms the last 18 years. And uh, it started as an organic vegetable farm, um, but then, you know, you need fertility somehow, right? And so we can either truck in horse manure from the surrounding horse farms, which, you know, sometimes we do. Um, But it's also, you know, you end up, for example, if anyone's grown zucchini, you know what happens when you when you don't stay on top of harvesting your zucchini, you end up with these baseball bat zucchinis, right? (laughs) Um, and so you can either compost those or you can feed them to a chicken who can then turn them into eggs. Right. Um, and so we don't waste food because any crop leftovers just get fed to the pigs or the chickens, um, or the, the sheep. And so, um, at the end of the season, when we um, plant cover crops or have what we call crop residue. So for example, with, um, our Brussels sprouts, we leave them, we leave the stalks there. So we harvest the little knobs of Brussels sprouts off and we have a vegetable, organic vegetable CSA, but then we leave the stalks in the field and we'll bring in the goats and the sheep who love Brussels sprout, <laughs> sprout stalks. Um, we'll plant a cover crop of rye uh, for the winter time to keep the soil in place so that it doesn't blow off in you know New England winters, but then we'll graze the sheep and goats on that and they're getting, you know, great new uh, feed, but then they're also fertilizing the soil at the same time. So I think uh, the goal of any any farm should be to be as uh, closed loop as possible. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't, you know, pull in, we get um, fish emulsion is one of the fertilizers that we use uh, out of Gloucester because there's, you know, fish le- leftovers that some smart person decided, you know, to start a fertilizer company that way. Um, So we do use some, some outside fertilizers. We get um, praying mantises sent to us in the mail and we'll release them in the greenhouses to go after any aphids on the, on the lettuce, things like that. Um, But we do try to be as closed loop as possible. And that requires animal inputs and that requires eating of the animals. Um, Because if we don't eat them, you can't just keep them forever. I mean, animals multiply and, um, you know, somebody has to take charge of their population, right? So we could either have them, let them have a natural death by coyotes in our area, or we could, you know, keep them safe from the coyotes and um, give them a humane death. And so, you know, I take that very seriously. I'm on the board of Animal Welfare Approved, which is one of the gold standards for humane animal treatment. Um, and then Rob and I also work a lot with the Savory Institute, which is all about teaching farmers regenerative agriculture. Um, and so what a perfect marriage between, um, you know, regenerative agriculture and then nutrition is really to like, look at everything from the lens of evolutionary biology and just trying to mimic nature in every way as much as possible. That's really beautiful. I, I love everything that the Savory Institute is doing and just in educating people and farmers on how to really become regenerative farmers and take care of, of their soil and their land. When it comes to sourcing the right kind of protein or meat and, and finding regenerative farms, I know you guys mentioned that there may not be a big difference in the nutritional content, but I think in, the, in feeling like you're being ethically responsible and you know supporting a better world um, how can people source and find the best resources 
So we're actually, um, we, we do talk about it a little bit in the book um, and just kind of illustrate like what a regenerative farm looks like um, because grass-fed meat could mean that those animals are just on the same paddock all season for grazing or it might mean that they're moved frequently, right? And so we're trying to empower people with the right tools so that they can go to the farmer's market or visit a farm and actually know what they're looking for and know what questions to ask. Um, but we also have resources on our website for ethical sourcing as well and through the course that we're doing. Um, so, you know, folks know even more about that. Um, and then there's certain partners that we're working with that we love. Um, there's, But we always encourage folks to try to find uh, as close a source to home as possible that they feel good about. And it's important... Um, you know, as you said, we, we, we think all meat is healthy and that's just a scientific fact. Um, but we highly encourage folks to support a better system. And, and Kelly, I'll add a little caveat to that. We do devote some time in the book to not making perfect the, uh, you know, the enemy of, of good enough. So currently grass-fed meat, holistically managed uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and, and animal products are more expensive. And that is entirely an artifact of a broken food system built on subsidies that, that guarantee a monopoly by a, a very few you know, enormous uh, entities. And so people will often decry the, the, the regenerative ag movement that it's elitist and it's not you know, acknowledging the, the plight of people who are living at the margin and that's why we really make the case that if you are, are struggling financially, if you're living on the margin, eat as well as you can. You know, a, a animal products for you and your family are going to provide a disproportionate advantage with regards to your health, with regards to your ability to think and reason and problem solve and, and change your situation. So this is, and then, you know, if, if we're able to really fight this fight, eventually this good food will be cheaper in the long run. And the fact that a Twinkie costs less than an apple, the fact that a 32-ounce bottle of soda can be like 99 cents, but a regular small bottle of water is $5, that's all artificial stuff. Like that's, that's, that's fake, funny money going on. So what we have to do, we have to, to also allow people to enter this system where they can and to just recognize that focusing on a nutrient-dense, higher quality, lower processed food you know, experience is going to disproportionately benefit themselves, their families, and their, their communities. And you know, in this, this time of COVID, we've seen some food uh, you know, shortages and different things like that. That is shining a light on how brittle and broken our food system is. And uh, 1940s, 1950s, we actually had arguably a much more resilient food system. It would have been difficult to shut down the, the food production of whatever flavor, but because we've consolidated power and throughput into a very few uh, processing hubs, it's incredibly easy to, to damage or break that system. Yeah, it's, and it's also, you think about Talk about transportation admissions. You've got how many exactly. production facilities across the country trucking, you know, trucking all over, all over the country, state to state, and we're not, we're not thinking about that. And then even I remember like learning about respiration rates with like fruits and vegetables, and like the vitamin C content in broccoli being, you know, twenty five percent of what you need in a day, but like seven days later, there's like it's undetectable. Right. You know, and it's it it's really about like supporting your local farmers and your and buying locally and and really trying to just try your best, right? I mean, that's all we can do. Um, try our best and and try to eat as nutrient dense as possible. Exactly. Oh my gosh, I feel like that was really powerful. <laughs> I should give you a soapbox. That was perfect. <laughs> um, when it comes to recommendations that you make for people, you've obviously just done a great job um, rounding it, you know, giving us an overview. But you, you talk about at the end of the book, to eat like a nutrivore. Can you explain what that is and what that means? Sure. I mean, when, when we focus on the most nutrient-dense food possible, we're more satiated. Um, you naturally would not choose the Twinkie, right? You would, you would choose other, you would choose a steak over that. Um, and, um, you're just operating on all cylinders better. It's, it's so, 
So let's take the emotion out of it and show me uh, your diet and let's figure out how to optimize that in the most nutrient dense way. And that would include, you know, red meat, it would include, you know, organ meats, if that's something you can do. Um, but no worries. If not, there's some awesome like desiccated liver tablets that you, you know, pills that you can take if you want to. Um, shellfish off the charts as far as uh, nutrition per calorie of oysters, for example. So that's a great thing to pull in. I try to eat them on a very regular basis. Um, and so it's really just looking at it almost you know, like a nutritionist, like you're a stock portfolio and you're just trying to line it all up so that you're as diversified as possible when it comes to your nutrition. And if you just start thinking about food in that way, like what's my protein, what's my vegetable... Uh, we have a meal matrix in there that people really um, love. And it's something that actually when I when I met Rob back in like 2009 or something, um, it was in his presentation. And it was the one thing I remember the most out of it. Uh, but you can just p- kind of like, you know, pick a protein. And this is how I think now when I'm at home, what meat do I have thawed in the fridge? Um, what vegetable do I have that's fresh? And you know, how am I going to, how am I going to make this, how am I going to spice it up? Am I going to add some fresh herbs? Am I going to, you know, add some garlic? Like, what am I going to do? And how am I going to turn this into a meal? And that's how I think about every, every dinner um, when I'm about to cook for my family. Uh, And so again, buy, you know, organic if you can, but a doctor would never tell a patient to only eat organic vegetables or don't eat vegetables. Right. And so that's how we feel about meat. Um, you know, buy the best meat you can afford. Try to find a local farmer. At our farm, we do work for shares, um, but everyone we're full. Like, don't, don't uh, <laughs> come after us for, for that. We, we, we do get a lot of people that want to do that, but there's opportunities. You know, if you don't have a lot of money, labor or site, if you're a web developer, um, but there's a lot of ways that you can get involved in your local food system and make better choices. I love that. I don't know if you guys know much about kind of like what I preach, but it's basically the same. It's called the Fab Four. It's protein, fat, fiber, and greens. I mm-hmm. do the same thing you do because I, I do get boxes of protein sent to my, like frozen protein sent to my um, house. And that's how I decide like, okay, well, I'm going to pull this out and defrost it. All right, what fat am I using with that? What fiber? Or you know, I'm just thinking about what veggies and and how my mm-hmm. how my increasing color. I just I love that so much. It's it doesn't have to be rocket science. And if we get used to eating simply, it's amazing what like a cast iron or like a nice little char and a veggie and like a delicious protein can do for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also when you when you make it simply, you're less likely to overeat. Um, we don't need hyper palatable food explosions in our mouth for every single meal. Totally. Yeah. I will stop on a salmon filet, but if there's a pizza in front of me, it's trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true of everybody. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Well, this was so awesome. I'm so excited to share Sacred Cow. I literally cannot wait for the film and the course. I will be one of the first people to sign up and watch. So let me know how I can support you guys and get it out there. This is... I think this is really needed. Um, there's a couple, there's actually one more question that I'd love to touch on just mm-hmm. because if you have the science on this, I'd really love for you to touch on it. A couple of things that come up in a lot of plant based books, um, even some that I've read recently and people that I've interviewed, um, their case for not eating red meat is on mTOR or TMAO. Um, is there anything you can touch on in, for those two or either specifically um, just to like, to explain your your side of the story. <laughs> yeah. Diana, do you want me to jump in on that one? Yes, please. So the, the let's do the TMAO first. So TMAO is a, a gut-derived molecule that has been associated with inflammation, but it's had a really interesting story. So for a long time, the, the more vegan-centric crowd has said, uh, meat elevates TMAO. That means it's bad. Um, But the thing is, is TMAO has always been kind of correlated to inflammation, but it's never been pinned down as being a problem. Just the fact that it's there doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. And then some really uh, difficult to reconcile information emerged. Fish elevates TMAO an order of magnitude more than meat does. And this information was not included in the reports vilifying TMAO and meat. 
because it doesn't fit the narrative, even though the very hardcore vegan centric uh, line is that fish is just as bad as, as everything else. There's kind of a reality, you know, when we start getting it like the World Health Organization level and the Harvard School of Medicine, they're, they're pretty forgiving with fish. And so this was kind of a, a, a difficult to reconcile fact because when we look at the epidemiology, like a, a fatty fish consistently, you know, beneficial, beneficial, beneficial. And then some research emerged that was painting TMAO as a net metabolic benefit that it actually might have some immune modulating uh, benefits. And it was kind of ironic. It's kind of like reading 1984 when they had that giant meeting where um, the people they were fighting became their friends and the people that were their friends became their enemy. And it just turned on a, on a dime. And this is what happened. A, 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 some research suggested that TMAO was now actually metabolically healthy. And some folks out of the vegan-centric world started saying, hey, look at this. Beans and, and nuts elevate TMAO. So TMAO study is, is kind of, or topic is, is kind of interesting in that regard. And uh, I, I could probably bore folks w- with that more. But the, um, the mTOR topic, it, you know, mTOR is related to things like autophagy, uh, protein recycling, program cell death. We need all of that. And what's interesting is in overfed populations, whether we're talking about humans or animals, mTOR is turned on too often. And it definitely leads to elevated rates of inflammation. It definitely leads to elevated uh, cancer potential and whatnot. But what, what's been missed in that story is it's a very different picture to be adequately fed using protein, carbs, fat versus overfed with protein, carbs, fat. So a hyperinsulinemic individual, they have chronically elevated insulin levels. That it, it, even though I'm a fan of low-carb diets, over the course of time, I've come to, to recognize that it's not specifically carbohydrates that are the driver of insulin resistance. It's overeating that is the driver of insulin resistance. And elevated insulin levels are one of the primary drivers of mTOR expression. So it's a... I, one of the big talks that I, I do each year this year is called uh, Longevity, Are We Trying Too Hard? And that one I think is kind of broadly available out on the interwebs now. And so if folks want to really deep dive on that, just just look up uh, Rob Wolf, Longevity, and they should be able to, to find that piece. But the, the real takeaway is if we are eating at a adequate protein level to maintain muscle mass. And here's a, a quick aside that I almost forgot about. All of us are going to face a process called sarcopenia, which is, is loss of muscle mass, particularly fast twitch muscle mass. And this is a guarantee. If you live long enough, you are going to eventually lose effectively all of your fast twitch muscle fibers. And this is when we become decrepit and, and uh, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to live a high quality of life. If people are active and they eat well, that doesn't happen until about 95 or 100. So you can have a pretty darn good run. But people who are sedentary, people who are inflamed, people who are hyperinsulinemic, this sarcopenia happens very early. And this is a guarantee. We know for a fact we will all battle sarcopenia. Not all of us are going to develop cancer. Not all of us are going to develop heart disease. Not all of us are going to develop diabetes. Those things are potentialities that can be modified with different interventions. But what we know crystal clearly is that in aging populations, elevated protein intake slows the sarcopenic process. It slows the loss of muscle mass. And that's even if you aren't particularly active. If you actually lift some weights, do a little bit of sprinting, a 90-year-old can have the physical capacity of a 50-year-old. So it's really remarkable what adequate nutrition and a and, uh, you know, little bit of strength training can provide and what I'm finding these days, that even people in kind of the ancestral health, low-carb crowd, they're super geeked out on fasting. They're doing protein restriction. And these people do not look healthy. And they don't carry a, an, an amount of muscle mass that is consistent with what their age is. They look older than what they really are. And, and so I, I guess that that's kind of my big case without going super deep into, into some of the scientific mechanisms is that we know for a fact we're all going to face muscle mass as we, muscle mass loss as we age. Let's stack the deck favorably there because 
having good muscle mass helps to ensure that we don't become diabetic. It's actually a hedge against developing cancer. Like there's all these benefits that come out from that. Whereas like these really extreme protein restriction, fasting and, and things like that, it's incredibly speculative. And, and you know, it, it, we could make a case that it's probably not that healthy. I love that. Leaving people with the cliffhanger. Yeah, <laughs> I will. Uh, I will link to your longevity um, talk in the show notes, along with links to the book and and everything that you guys have mentioned earlier, like the course and the film to be. So, where can people follow along? Where can they support? Um, and where can they follow you personally? Yeah. Um, so the the Sacred Cow Project, uh, the umbrella for, for most of the stuff that we've been talking about today is all at sacredcow.info. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, folks can do that. And if they do pre-order, um, if this makes it out uh, before, we have some really great thank yous that we're, that we're doing for folks if they submit their receipt. Um, and we'll, uh, folks can also sign up to get updates on the film there as well and learn about the course and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I, my nutrition practice is sustainabledish.com and I'm on most social media at sustainable dish. And then Rob, you weren't able to get raw at Rob Wolf for Instagram. No, somebody, uh, this poor chap that, um, on Twitter, when Twitter was a big thing, he is also an R O B B W O L F, but it was like Rob underscore wolf and everybody was tagging him on stuff. And the guy is really hilarious. He's a, musician, a chain smoker, hard drinker. And he was just like, I hate you and all these people. And so I actually sent him a case of whiskey, just apologizing for all the the stuff that he got like wrapped up in and everything. He's like, okay, you're not that bad of a guy. But he did ping me and he's like, hey, by the way, I, I snaked Rob Wolf on, on Instagram. So I am Das Rob Wolf on Instagram. Although I have to admit, uh, I'm doing as little on social media as I possibly can these days. I, I find the whole experience to be kind of depressing and toxic. And so I, I am mainly a broadcast medium there. And then if folks want to actually uh, interact with me in the community that we've built, that's over at The Healthy Rebellion. And uh, it's join.thehealthyrebellion.com. And our goal there is to help liberate a million people out of the sick care system. I love it. I feel the same way about social media. <laughs> it's good that necessary it's, evil it's a currently. necessary evil, but um, but I do appreciate because I do watch your little your little um, podcast clips on your Insta, awesome. so it, it's it's motivating to pop over to the community. So, um, you guys, thank you so much for your time. I can't even, like I said, I can't even wait. Let's let's blow this up. Let's get people understanding the real nitty gritty about the nutrition of meat, the ethical case, um, and the environmental case, because we all want better soil, more nutritious plants, and more nutritious bodies. So I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at BeWellByKelly.com and follow me on Instagram at BeWellByKelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 